very common method again is uh, the most like you know uh, commonly used uh, method uh, is the C and Idris who started all this and also like you know we are still uh, using it for analytical simplify and uh, simplify as a simplified procedure is uh, how to convert like a PGA into psychic stress ratios so the whole idea is like you know if you have a uh, uh, these are ground motions and this need to be like at the soil right so that's why we need to uh, do the size response analysis to convert uh, a backwalk level uh, acceleration time history to uh, the to uh, acceleration time history at the ground surface because that's where uh, liquefaction happens you know liquefactions won't happen at uh, actually liquefactions are uh, is 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 uh, happen at the shallow ground. Uh, if you if you have a vertical stress greater than one uh, uh, atm uh, amorphotic pressure, is where it happens. Especially if you have like uh, asmothetic pressures like a three to five uh, atm, you know this this is starting to be like you know too too confined or too 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 high of uh, vertical stress for liquid fractions to be happened. So pretty much like it's a shallow ground behavior. So that's why we need to convert or we to like, you know, uh, do the uh, site response analysis to find out the, the response of the uh, uh, of uh, acceleration time history at shallow ground. So after you have that uh, acceleration time history, uh, you can identify the maximum point. And then you take the maximum point as the PGA, uh, you normalize it by the uh, by the g over here and then you times uh, 0.65 uh, divided by the magnetic, magnetic scaling factors we will talk about this like uh, uh, in the next slide and then times the uh, total stress divided by the vertical stress and also divide uh, multiply by a, a, a depth of reduction factors we will talk about this along with the MSF uh, in the next slide so pretty much this is a framework for uh, based on based on um, the uh, acceleration time history that you design for can convert it to become a psychic stress ratios then you can do your site specific uh, uh, liquefactions uh, evaluations or liquef so this pretty much like is kind of like a screening tool people do uh, once they have their site specific data you want to see whether uh, like you know, means like CPT or SPT data you want to see uh, have a quick check uh, whether like you know you, you, uh, your site is susceptible for the refractions to be happens then you will uh, calculate the CSR based on these like, ground motions so this psychic like, stress ratios you know this like a line here pretty much is plot by that plot by like uh, the equations here because uh, now these two terms actually these three terms are function of depth so uh, you can you can uh, from this def and CSL with this equations because this is uh, this this three terms these are functions of uh, z the def so you can kind of like a uh, plot out the uh, the curve there the CSL versus def uh, based on these equations uh, provided you have already uh, known your PGA so uh, this this framework you realize that uh, it has a uh, correction factor 0.65 why 0.65 you know that's based on the early work from a seed uh, you know he has some work that like also convert a uh, uh, series time history uh, into a series of harmonic motions such that like you know uh, he can uh, more easy to uh, try to model uh, uh, the earthquake phenomenon in the lab because remember back to the old days it's not like uh, quite possible to to input a, a erratic uh, uh time history with positions in the lab but simple uh, harmonic science uh, forms is doable those cyclic like loading and actually it's more practical to use like a series of harmonic motions uh, to represent a, a service and time history so um what what like uh, the seed 1975 uh, you know, work they had done is taking 65 percent of the PGA and then convert that into a series of uh, harmonic motions. So it's about and it's about 10. 
So he he tried to uh, represent uh, earthquake ground motions by you know uh, a series of like a uh, ten harmonic motions with an uh, amplitude equals to sixty five percent of the PGA. So that what like you know that laboratory modeling we do in the early days, and uh, we're uh, we are still doing it uh, you know uh, today uh, in nowadays. So that's why you know this Harry C. He is the father of uh, Jupiter earthquake engineering. Pretty, pretty much he, he laid down the foundations uh, for us to follow. Uh, but nowadays, like you know, it's it's, it's possible uh, to perform a, uh, like a real time uh, acceleration time history in the lab. But yet, yeah, it's where uh, it's only limited. Like you can able to do it and more for research. In practice, we still use like harmonic motions uh, to model uh, uh, earthquake ground motions. So that's the equations to convert again to convert uh, uh, acceleration time history into a CSR. And one more comments about this method, like you know, um, this the method, the Zanichus method is a very good start, but for sure you also have some shortcoming. One of the short, uh, major start shortcoming is uh, pretty much you are trying to represent uh, earthquake ground motions with only one data point. So this uh, you only consider the peak uh, magnitude, and you ignore a lot of aspect of uh, of uh, earthquake ground motions. Uh, you know uh, those temporal. Uh, 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 difference and also uh, the frequency difference, right? So uh, it, you only use one point. You f you fail to uh, describe how long the durations of earthquake may be, and also like you know how the frequency content it is. You know, you could be like a soft soil response that uh, you have many like uh, uh, relatively like a long period uh, of uh, pulses versus like you could be a steep soil response that you have a lot of like. Uh, small uh, pulses they pack to each other so uh, part of it you know to to adjust for the loading durations uh, uh, it will be handled by the correction factors of uh, uh, the man magnitude scaling factors we will talk about it next okay so uh, let's further to talk about um, this triggering uh, models or triggering uh, liquefaction triggering relations uh, framework which is given this equations there so um, if you look at this equations uh, pretty much like you know um, you we try to characterize uh, earthquake loading or earthquake ground motions by one bond which is the PGA the peak ground accelerations um, and then like you know uh, around this um, this intensity measure we try to correct uh, with different like a uh, you know, design scenario that you may have. So uh, so you see, we come with a bunch of like a different like uh, parameters. So we talk about uh, the original framework uh, from seed. It also has the uh, the total stress divided by the vertical effective stress. So you kind of like you know take care of the uh, the open burdens or stress uh, issue. Because again, liquefaction also depends on the stress level you're at, and upon the point six five there is try to correct for the uh, uh, the peak, the peak ground accelerations. Because uh, it would be too conservative if you just take the uh, maximum uh, loading amplitudes from uh, our ground motions. So um, that's a couple correction factors to come up. Uh, first, uh, talk about the MSF. So it stands for the magnitude. A scaling factors. So um, the, the 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 philosophy or the reason behind this is um, they would think um, the longer uh, loading period come from larger uh, earthquake magnitudes. So again, like you know, if you have a high amplitude earthquake, if you have like a uh, magnitude of eight earthquake versus a magnitude of like a five earthquakes uh that would be you could expect there would be a there would be different like a loading durations so this msf is try to uh, bring in the time dimensions of our earthquake events you know we know that like pga is just one pawn but like when you see the ground motions you know you can you can last from maybe from uh, 15 seconds to uh up to like a one 120 seconds 
And we're using one point cannot capture the uh, the duration, so that uh, the time effect over there. But the SMS uh, try to correlate with uh, the durations with the mana deals. So it's very like uh, uh, rough estimations, uh, but somehow like you know you uh, try to um, bring in the factors. So using this MSS, MSF like uh, um, factors, and this uh, graph here shows you a house. MSF factors change with uh, the uh, earthquake magnitudes, and uh, they use magnitude seven and a half as a reference. Because uh, a seven and a half, so seven and a half is here. The MSF factors is equals to one. So which means like uh, um. What they try to do here is uh, when you have an earthquake uh, a event that is greater than 7.5, then you get a, a magnitude scaling factor less than 1. And the reciprocal of it will uh, increase the, the loading, the CSRs, like the stress ratios. But if you have an uh, earthquake magnitude less than 7.5, they will try to penalize your uh, earthquake uh, loading. So 7.5 is the reference point. And that's a bunch of different uh, research done in the past. So that's why you see different, like a different data doc over there. So the Idris one and Idris uh, Arango. So uh, more or less, they are a little bit uh, different, but like uh, uh, the philosophy behind. So you know why the difference? Very well, likely because they they have a different database to look at, uh, and and th with time you could. Uh, uh, you could imagine we have more and more earthquake records, especially the significant ones, uh, such that like uh, this MS, MSL uh, uh, relationships or these equations there will be keep updating. So uh, you know some of the uh, correlations over there is is really outdated already, especially the, like the 1988 or the 1983 the Japanese one. You know I don't think any people will be using uh, those. Uh, correlations now because uh, one thing like you know some of them was quite dangerous is uh, even this like embassy like a, a 1988 uh, method you, you go forever high and go forever low and uh, this may not be true because especially for you when you have very small earthquake and a very large earthquake so um, the later uh, developments they try to cap it uh, with more reasonable boundary uh, as at either like a very small earthquake or a very large earthquake. So uh, what I want you to get out from this is uh, you understand, you know, uh, what MSF, the mental scaling factor do. And also, you know, keep that in mind. Um, those uh, correlations or those factors will be updated from time to time, especially like, you know, when we get like a more and more significant data uh, from recent earthquakes. And the the other factors is um, the death um, reductions factors. So the purpose of having this L sub D over there is um, is to correct for the uh, liquefactions triggering with the uh, depth because uh, the deeper you go, uh, the less likely uh, like liquefactions will be happens. So liquefactions is a phenomenon that uh, happens at, uh, you know, uh, the shallow ground um, uh, with a depth. Uh, if you get a great, really great depth, I don't think, I don't think like you know, liquefactions will happen because the confining stress is so high that uh, you know, if you understand, under if you truly understand like a critical state soil mechanics, uh, the dilative behavior of soil depends on both density and also the vertical stress, the confining stress. So when you have a very high confining stress, no matter what density you are at, very likely you will have a dilative response versus like a contractive response uh, uh, of of the same behavior. So when you have dilative response, you're generating um, a negative excess pop pressure, which will increase your soil strength rather than decrease. So you may have psychic mobility, but you know your loading and also your uh, uh, loading durations maybe may not be strong and long enough to 
to, to move past the uh, psychic mobility to the full type of uh, solid factions. So those are the two factors. And again, like uh, this L sub D, like the MSS uh, scaling factors, uh, from time to time, uh, those correlations will be updated. Uh, because again, we will have more uh, data to kick scene and um, those uh, uh, informations or those uh, correlations uh, will be changed. So if this is like a, a very fast evolving, uh, uh, you know, engineering business, unlike uh, the geotech, the traditional geotechs that, uh, you know, everything on the statics and, you know, whatever we find out in the sixties, uh, uh, the world didn't change much. So we're still living on earth and, uh, you know, the, the, um, so the framework and the, and the analysis, analytical approach is still uh, valid. Uh, but for earthquake engineering, you know, every decade thing will like, you know, uh, we have, uh, uh, new generations of models just come up, so it's, you need to pretty much keep learning uh, if you want to stay in this business. So this slide uh, gives you an idea on uh, how we establish the SPT-based uh, solid corrections triggering curve. So, so this is the uh, solid correction tr uh, triggering curve right there. So pretty much like we use this for design, and this is the very first one from uh, 1979, come out from SEAT. So how he come up with this? Uh, pretty much like the X and Y axis. So the X axis you can think of as kind of like the loading. So he calculate the psychic stress ratios, uh, very similar to uh, to what we have on these equations, but uh, back to the old days, uh, he have a more, even more simplified framework. So pretty much it's just like a convert, like a, maybe an earthquake record to a shear stress time history, uh, using Euclidean's leans, uh, Euclidean's like a site response analysis, and then divided that by the vertical stress. Um, so even like a not bother with the uh, mental scaling factors and also the, uh, the, uh, death read that reductions are factors, uh, but that was the old days. But like the concept here is like you know uh, from each k history, so each data point there is a k history. So this could be like the uh, San Francisco earthquake. This could be the uh, the Japanese uh, Koyota earthquakes. Uh, this could be the uh, the Taiwan Chi Chi earthquakes. So I'm making I'm making that up, but like you know. Um, this could be the 1999, oh, that's even before 1999. So 1999 has uh, a very famous uh, uh, earthquake, uh, Turkey, the Kojali earthquake. But anyway, it's like, you know, each uh, data point represents like earthquake record, and then he, he back calculate the loading, and then he find like this on the site, he find the, uh, the SPT uh, data. So this represent the uh, resistance. So the saw resistance represented by SPT blow count. And then like, uh, uh, he, he has the, the, the binary classifications where the, like, uh, the dark one is the, uh, where liquefactions to be happens. And the open one is like, uh, there's no liquefactions, uh, happen. So remember we watched the uh, YouTube clip together, uh, the evidence of liquefactions. See, see whether you see the sand, uh, sand boiling on the sand, uh, ejector. Uh, effects where they can trace uh, the excess pole pressure being shoot out from the site, then they can they will they will know like uh, whether liquefactions happen or not. So uh, with those classifications, uh, they can uh, draw uh, try to draw a reasonable uh, boundary curve. So we call this the uh, uh, liquefactions capacity curve, and then apply this like kind of like a worldwide for design. So if uh, if you know your SPT, then you can have a quick estimate. Uh, you know your SPT, and then also you know your uh, psychic stress ratios. Then uh, we you can have a quick estimate uh, whether like you know you should expect as a solid refraction so is tricky or not. So that's the SPT, uh, the old days, and uh, I have one that like a uh, quite uh, uh, quite used oftenly. So this even is not the most updated versions. But like uh, this is a very recent work that like uh, uh, been well recognized, and I updated. I'm uh, sorry, uploaded two papers on uh, on Canfax. So if you go to Canfax, 
uh, go to 5700. So if you go to Canfax, um, uh, the most updated one should be the Seton uh, 2018 method. So that is um, the most updated uh, SPT method for uh, solid refraction triggerings. And uh, for sure, like, you know, I think Seedens, he pretty much like uh, you would expect, uh, he built on Bulang J8 just like a model. So, uh, so you, you can see the difference between like a 2012 and 1979. Uh, you have mo much more data points now. And uh, the red dots means like uh, you find the uh, liquefaction's evidence. The open dots is you don't have it. And um, now nowadays, like uh, uh, deterministic analysis, um, you know, we try to move move past that. Uh, we we adopt more probabilistic approach. So they even give you um, uh, three different probabilistic uh, capacity curve right there. So fifteen percent of like a likelihood for liquefactions to be happens. Or eighty-five percent of uh, liquefaction's uh, uh, capacity curve uh, uh, for, like you know, uh, for for that being triggered. So it can be uh, expressed in terms of probability. And um, here is the their probability model. So if you want to code it, uh, if you want to develop your own uh, com uh, computations like a program or in MATLAB or Excel spare heat, you can use the code here. Uh, but if you want to do a quick analysis, uh, deterministic approach, you know, somehow you, you bring in some probabilistic, uh, components right there, you know, you can just read off the curve. So, so, th so all the corrections are there, the M160 cleans and, and this is a uh, truly compatible with, um, uh, the CSL right here that we talk about. So he has already correct for the Matthew scaling factors, uh, the, the death, uh, factors. So um, you can you, you calculate everything uh, through this uh, tri triggering uh, solid liquefaction triggering equations. So you get the y-axis, you know the loading, and then compare with your corrected SPT resistance at the end blow counts. So that is uh, the SPT approach. And uh, for more informations about uh, how to calculate the M160, this like a seat. Uh, Raymond seat, not the Harry seat. The, so the younger seat, the, the seat, uh, the junior seat, uh, you know, who, who just retired, even though like, you know, uh, the junior seat, uh, he retired, I think a couple of years ago from Berkeley. But this is his work, uh, in 2003. So he give you at least, uh, or he can walk you through how to correct the, uh, SBTN values from, uh, to N160 clean sand. So, uh, just give you the details uh, and how courage you read the paper uh this the law 2003 paper you may be a little bit out of date but um uh, i think seat uh, uh professor Raymond seat he did a good job on uh, explaining uh the you know the the overall design procedure uh in the seat 2003 paper so um that's a uh, spt approach likewise you also have a cpt approach so if if you do your site, uh, site investigation program with CPT rather than SPT, so very similar concept. Uh, you have the uh, uh, the probability state uh, solid refractions uh, triggering capacity curve right there. Uh, uh, again, like a uh, Boulang Dre, you just uh, UC Davis, they did a lot of good work. Uh, they both uh, so. Idris is kind of like uh, the very f uh, two first two students uh, of uh, uh, the the famous Harry Seat at Berkeley. I think back to sixties, uh, and then like a Bulong Jays is is uh, is all is the last uh, almost uh, the last students of uh, 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 Doctor Harry Seat uh, in the late eighties and early nineties at, at Berkeley. So uh, even though like uh, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Harris, Professor Harry said he passed away in the middle of uh, Dr. Boulanger's uh, PhD study at Berkeley. So I ended up like uh, Dr. Boulanger's uh, uh, dissertation is signed off by uh, the junior seat. But anyways, uh, so uh, they somehow they, they they both become faculty at UC Davis and uh, they did a lot of good work on uh, in the topic of solid refractions. Uh, so, so that's why like, you know, in California and also um, 
uh, particularly in the geotech earthquake engineering like a business is strongly influ influenced by by uh, the the Berkeley grad and again the, the textbook that uh, you read uh, from Steve Kramer is also very important uh, players or important like, contributors uh, in, in all this subject uh, as well as like uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Professor John Jonathan Bray and now who is still working at Berkeley uh, he is uh, again one of the last students of uh, Dr. Harry Seed. But anyways, um, so this is the CPT uh, framework, and you know all this um, probabilistic uh, capacity curve. And if you want to know the equations of how to come up with those curve, so this is the SPT, uh, uh, sorry, the CPT probabilistic capacity curve. So again, if you know your uh, CPT values, like you know, uh, this chart demonstrate uh, whether it is still like you know a cast uh, a binary classifications, where like you are above uh, the curve is liquefactions expect to be happens, below the curve is uh, there's no uh, liquefactions, and in between all those are kind of like the marginal case. So you need to be like uh, for sure you need to have like a. Uh, uh, third uh, examinations, uh, whether how likely uh, the crew fractions will happen. So if you uh, fall between those, uh, you know your your, de your design scenario based on loading and resistance fall between like the the the, the red and the blue uh, curve capacity curve right there. You know those are the most difficult uh, uh, analysis or decisions that uh, the engineers need to make. You know. Uh, rather, you should you should you should treat it as or you should do a ground improvement to avoid uh, solid uh, you know solid confections to be happens. Uh, if 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 you you know if your design point is out here or right there, you know you make your choice easy. You know you know for very likely you know, nothing is uh, is hundred percent sure how how uh, when you deal with uh, earthquakes. Uh, design, but you know you have some sort of certainty when you are far away from those curve. But anyways, like uh, this gives an idea of how the CPT works, and uh, likewise, um, a, a Stokey at Texas, you know, he's the one that like <laughs> one of the, the anti Berkeley camp. So uh, earthquake engineering, uh, uh, the geotechnical earthquake engineering, at some points, like you know. Uh, it's kind of like divided into two parties, you know, a little bit like our country now. Uh, is the Berkeley camps versus the rest of the world, you know, could be the Texas people and also the Japanese, like, uh, uh, scholar. Uh, they have different views on how to, uh, look at this issue. And then, uh, they come out with another approach, uh, instead of like a last strain to behavior that you use. SBT or CPT, uh, they truly believe uh, the soil behavior or the, uh, the dynamic of a soil properties is uh, dictated by uh, small strain behavior, which means like uh, they don't uh, buy into those destructive um, geotech investigations or geotech field index like CPT or SPT, but they more have put more like a faith into uh, a small string parameters like the shear string, uh, shear wave. Uh, Velocity, which is a small string of behavior, uh, small string measurements, like, you know, the cost hole and the down hole we talk about in the soil dynamic, soil dynamic uh, properties lecture. So again, like, you know, uh, uh, so Dr. Stokey at Texas, so, uh, uh, Andrews is his, like, a student. So he come up with those again, like, uh, the, uh, triggering curve, uh, so it's all liquefaction capacity curve, uh, divided the data that like they, they find, uh, where you have liquefactions uh, versus no liquefactions. And then depends on different scenario, you know, those are the, uh, the shear wave velocity curve, uh, which is less, uh, uh common in practice. Uh, I, I guess one of the uh, main reason is uh, it's not cheap, but it's not common to get, uh, shear wave velocity measurements, running those cost over downhole tests. It's more common, uh, you know, commonly available uh, for those SPT and CPT investigations. Okay, so uh, building up on the CSR stress uh, profiles, uh, we have two more correction factors that I want to talk about. First is the uh, K sigma, which is the overburden correction factor. 
So this is correcting the overburning stress, uh, a little bit like the death uh, reduction fact, uh, factors. So this correction factors pretty much is um, this help you to uh, to change to you know to penalize uh, the loading or to reduce loading when you're at like greater depth, which means like higher higher overburden stress, or like. Uh, uh, when you're at more shallow ground, when you have a lower confining stress, it will kind of like uh, pump up the loading, increase the loading. So that's, um, and they use like a, a 1 ATM or uh, as the reference point right here. So piece of A over there stands for a 1 asymptotic pressure. So which is, uh, so this is uh, a 1 ATM equals to, uh, the 2116 PSF. The other factors is what we call the uh, static shear stress uh, correction factors. Uh, so this one uh, is a correction for a kind of like a sloping ground. So when you have a sloping ground conditions, uh, there's kind of like a static shear stress adding on the soil. So this is very complicated and you know a lot of like research still need to be get done in this subject. Uh in the past two decades, I think like you know that was the um, the interest on in the research communities on how to um tackle this uh this problems because um the refractions in free field again which means like uh just like kind of like open ground it's likely not our interest, right? Because in urban settings, very likely, uh, you will have, uh, pretty much your project site, you do have a building over there. And your building will be imposing a static stress to your soil elements. So you will feel the stress stress on the elements, uh, soil elements. So the sloping ground is, is one kind of like a more simple loading adding on your soil that is uh, sub, uh, sus suspicious to uh, soil refractions triggering. Uh, you'll be even more complicated when you have a building, you have structural loading sitting uh, on, your, on your project site so where like you want to investigate the uh, the triggering of solid refractions. Uh, in fact, like uh, Dr. John uh, Professor Jonathan Bray at Berkeley, you know, focused on this subject, which is uh, trying to develop engineering procedure to find out um, uh, the effect of like structural loading on liquefactions like a uh, trigger, right? So it's quite fascinating. You know, you need like a, a very compact like a three D modeling uh, to look at those issues. So pretty much you need to use like a like a program like Flag to help you when you get get there uh, the effect of the structure. And like you know, again, like, if you want to learn Flag, uh, feel free to uh, take. Uh, uh, the the foundation of uh, the the advanced uh, geotech design course that we offer next semester C five six seven zero, but anyways I got the liquefactions uh, issue here is or this uh, case of alpha the the correction factors is try to uh, correct for the um, the sloping ground you, you think of that uh, this alpha values is this equals to the um, the shear stress divided by the uh, vertical effective stress. So if you know your alpha values and then like, you know, uh, you know your uh, M160 or Q uh, uh, CPT values there, you, you give you an estimate on what kind of case of alpha sh uh, sh you should be using. And you realize actually there's quite a, a lot of uncertainty when you go and you use those parameters. And uh, I pull out those graphs uh, from the uh, very origin original work from Idris and Boulanger, Boulanger, and I, you know, I bet like you know, uh, from time to time, you know, this this kind of uh, case of alpha will 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 make some minor change. So you need to keep an eye on how this case of alpha being changed, like you know, uh, with time. Or like you know, a more updated like a literature out there. But again, the the key concept here, the case of alpha, is for uh, 